everyone and welcome to the five steps to reduce project risk webinar. We are ready to begin after a quick introduction to our speakers. I'd like to introduce Jeff Russell, who is our VP of sales and Wes Gillette, who is our director of client services. And today, Wes and Jeff will be bringing you through a presentation with a little bit of background about Safran and um, more detail about Safran Risk. Without further ado, I'd like to hand over the presentation to Jeff Russell so that he can uh, take us into our presentation. Thank you. We'll be covering the uh, project and risk management trends. So really reviewing the recent trends in the market which led Safran to develop Safran Risk. I'll give you an overview of Safran the company. It's important to understand the company this product's coming from. And then we'll redu review the five steps to reduce project risk, basically a way to familiarize yourself with the different pieces of, of the Safran Risk tool. And then we'll hand it off to Wes for a product demo, and then we'll step into Q&A. So uh, Accenture did a, did a study on recent project and risk management trends, and what they found, um, the insights from this are, are really interesting. So project complexity and size are increasing. We all know that. We're in the, you know, we see this every day. But uh, more critically, only 30% of the projects that are being worked on are being delivered on budget. So 70% are over their original budget. And only 15% of projects are on time. So 85% of projects are over duration. So what Safford Risk is doing is providing risk professionals a way to evaluate and quantitate, quanti quantitative, <laughs> quantitative risk, excuse me, and these are both include duration and cost, and to support better project decisions and create a real opportunity for organizations to identify and mitigate risk earlier or throughout the project life cycle. Another study was done by A.T. Kearney, and this study was done twice, actually, over a, a three-year period of time, the first time in 08 and the second time in 11. And they asked a lot of questions around project and project, uh, project areas, and one of the areas they focused on was risk. So they asked about risk profiling and the level of concern about risk in projects. In 08, it was one and a half ticks out of five as a level of concern, so fairly low. By 11, it had increased to a four out of five level of concern, so the, the focus on risk was much higher within organizations. In addition, the percentage of senior management that perceived themselves as involved in risk in the organization was high. It was at 67%. And kind of supporting this as well is a PwC study that they interviewed uh, CEOs throughout the organizations, and 92% of CEOs said that information about risk was critical to the long-term success of their organizations. Uh, but out of the same group, only 23% felt that they had comprehensive information about risks to uh, effectively make decisions. So this is a great thing for all of us on the call, right? Us as, 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 as risk tool builders and you all as risk professionals. The, the level of focus on risk in the organizations has gone way up. So the importance on it is high and the, ability, the willingness to focus and invest to solve these solutions is really high. So it's really, really, really good news for all of us on this call. And it really leads to why Safran developed Safran Risk. There's a tool, Safran Risk, is is uh, is um, is 100 percent. I mean, as a company, Safran is 100 percent focused on project and risk management, exclusively where we spend our time and money. Uh, the Safran Risk tool it leverages the project scheduling engine from Safran, and even though it uses Safran's project scheduling engine, and it's a big differentiator of the tool, it also fully is inoper interoperable with Oracle Primavera and Microsoft Project. The tool is a true tool, so it's not a fit-for-purpose or service-oriented delivery. You're actually getting a tool. And we've leveraged um, the, uh, the former Pertmaster team to help us design and deliver this tool. So if you have familiarity with Rusty Johnson or Sam Khan, Glenn Jarrett, Fred Dahlberg, or even Wes, who was on the phone, was with, set, was with uh, Pertmaster, both pre- and post-acquisition, um, are all being um, used and leveraged within this organization to deliver the best tool possible. In addition to our own internal people, we're working externally and collaborate with, uh, with risk professionals and, and customers and users in, your, in, in the environment to provide great feedback on the tool. So let me give you a little bit of information about Safran and the company. So uh, Safran's been around 23 plus years. Uh, we've been delivering project scheduling tools for that time. It's, our tools are used by some of, the, some of the largest organizations in the world to deliver some of the most complex projects in the world. And really a key differentiator of Safran uh, is we're 100% focused on delivering project scheduling and risk tools to the market. There are no other area we spend our time or effort. In addition, in addition, the uh, areas we focus on are all asset intensive. So our area of focus is delivering the solution for the asset intensive space. So we define that as oil, gas, and chemical infrastructure, so airports, roads, etc., aerospace and defense, utilities, and the engineering and construction space. So at the end of the day, we're spending 100% of our time, energy, effort, and money 
on developing risk and project solutions for this space. It's a real differentiator for us in the market. So some sample customers of Safran um, are here on this list. Uh, ConocoPhillips is a great example. I mentioned that Safran project is used for delivering some of the most complex projects. ConocoPhillips recently completed one of the largest turnarounds or the largest turnaround in the history of the North Sea uh, using Safran project. And while that's impressive, I don't want to scare anyone off of the other tools. It's, we're not just exclusively used for the largest and most complex projects. Companies like Statoil use us as a standard throughout their organization for delivering all their small, medium, large, and complex projects. So we can be used across all areas of the organization for projects of any size. And so I mentioned earlier that uh, you know, our focus on, on this space, our exclusive focus on this space is a differentiator, really another core differentiator of, of Safran. So we focus on building fully integrated solutions for the task at hand. So uh, for example, with our Safran project, if you look in the left here, I think it represents what mo most people are very used to. We have a variety, as an organization, you have a variety of project scheduling tools you're interacting with or using on a daily basis. It can be Primavera, Safran, Microsoft Project. Layered on top of this are different risk tools, EVM tools, reporting tools, et cetera. And the end, is a, the end result is a pretty complicated soup of, of applications that you have to integrate, leverage, and use. And at the end of the day, uh, most users aren't using all of the capabilities of these tools. They really end up using just the minimum because it's just too complex to navigate and work between all these different tool sets. Safran takes a different approach and a different point of view. So the right on the right of this chart really reflects Safran project and, and, and generally our philosophy in developing tools. It's a, in one tool, we offer a fully integrated tool set with all the capabilities you need to get your job done day to day. So planning and scheduling, resource management. You'll see risk management here. Don't let that, don't let that uh, confuse today's uh, broadcast. We have some light risk management just around duration as, as a capability in our scheduling tool. It's completely separate from uh, the standalone risk tool we'll be covering today. We have what-if scenarioing, scenarios, change management, et cetera, all in one tool set. Really, the, the value of that is we give one tool for users to learn, one interface for them to learn, to learn, and they get a quicker time to value, and a lower cost for the organization to manage this tool set inherently. And we're taking the same approach with Saffron Risk. So um, we are giving you one tool that's fully integrated that a risk professional needs to do their job done every day. So the five steps to the project risk. The first thing I want to say here is please don't misunderstand this slide. We by no means are going to force you into a five-step process. If you have a much, much more complicated or in-depth process, you will not be forced to change your process within Safran Risk to leverage the tool set. We're simply using these steps as, the, as a way to walk you through Safran Risk and familiarize you with our tool set. So please, you know, don't, don't let this make you think we're going to force you into one way of approaching your risk in your organization. And step one of this is the schedule. So the first step is where the Saffron software differs, Saffron risk differs significantly from our competitors, is we have a fully integrated Saffron scheduling engine in the tool. And again, I mentioned this earlier, don't, that does not limit you to Saffron only schedules. You can easily bring in Primavera schedules, Microsoft project schedules, et cetera. And the second step is to evaluate and validate your schedule. So what's the integrity of your schedule? So we do a full uh, schedule validation and, and expose any issues with the schedule. So on this screenshot, you can see on the left the activities and the warnings. If you click through here, and Les will show you this in the demo, it really starts highlighting the value of having the integrated scheduling engine because it will drop you right into the schedule, into the activities with the issue, and allow you to modify and fix those problems. The third step is to model and analyze your risk by creating, correlating, and assigning risk at the project level most applicable. And what this means really is we give the ability to collapse and expand your project when you're assigning risk to it. So on the left, or the upper left, you can see that we had a, a project collapse down to some higher levels, say a WBS structure or a phase structure. On the right, we actually have the activities. So you can see early on in your project, you may want to assign risk at a very high level. And then as the project plan matures and you're closer to delivering it, you can go down to the activity level and assign your risks. And again, you'll get walked through this in, 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 in the live demo of the project. And finally, you have steps four and five, the review results and report. So after reviewing the initial results, the risk professional can easily revert back to the earlier steps two and five to uh, further validate, edit their schedule, recheck it, and rerun risk on it, and do that in a circular process until they're happy with the schedule. And then finally, once you're happy, step five is a report. You know, a big strength of SAF and risk is, in, is industry standard reports that we provide and the ability to, easy, to easily 
send those out for inclusion into websites or PDFs or any kind of reporting package you want to do. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to Wes for a product demonstration. Wes, let me make you a presenter here. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, as Jeff mentioned, my name is Wes Gillette. I'm the Director of Client Services here at Safran. Previously, I was Professional Services Manager at Pertmaster and Oracle Primavera. As Jeff talked about, he outlined five steps that you can take on your projects to reduce project risk. And what we're going to show you today is a way to accomplish those five steps using Safran Risk. And again, five steps is just merely kind of an indicator of how easy it can be to take those first steps and bring it in risk analysis and a quantitative risk analysis into your project controls environment. And we're going to walk through and just show just how easy that can be uh, using the new Safran Risk. So as you notice, as I open up Safran Risk, I see a list of global risk. The global risk, I think, are really important for an organization because it allows them to define at an enterprise level the maybe a template of risk that they want their projects to consider and make sure they're thinking broadly in terms of what are the risks that could impact the projects. It could also be an indication of how the organization is thinking strategically about certain key risks. Uh, for instance, uh, we see things here like merger or acquisition. Potentially, the organization knows that they're, um, they have a history of that in the organization and that has posed risk to their projects before, and so they want to have the projects incorporate that into their thinking as they think about their projects individually. Uh, we'll delve into the global risk uh, a little bit more here briefly, but just to kind of show you what we have, kind of the, the typical standard quantitative risk analysis capabilities where I'm able to define a risk, assign a probability, and define uh, a variety of impacts for each one of those risks. We'll touch on those specifics a little bit more in detail when we get to the project risk section. So as Jeff mentioned, step one is bringing in a schedule. And so here I've opened up a schedule directly from Safran Project. It's actually embedded here. Uh, we are using the, the same scheduler, the same application here. And so rather than an environment where you maybe have having a different tool that you have to export a schedule and worry about converting from one, school, uh, one project to another. Here we have the same schedule embedded here. The project team can be working on the project, making changes and updating this as they're doing the risk workshop or as they're just continuing to uh, progress the project. And we have one common interface. And so it's familiar, familiar tool sets uh, if you're within the Safran world. Now, Perhaps you're not using Safran, you're using Primavera P3, P6, SureTrack, or Microsoft Project. Those are all supported as well. The ability to import those, bring them in, and again, great scheduling engine here that we're able to use as we use the, do the quantitative risk analysis here in a, in a, in a few minutes. So um, I'm able to bring in my schedule, enterprise level schedule, um, you know, connected to the enterprise and bring in one of those projects and begin to work on that. So I could make changes here, and that begins to that saves it back uh, as part of my overall inter enterprise project. Now, I brought in my schedule. I want to move on to step two, and just make sure that my schedule is uh, risk ready. Right, it's part of that validate and edit uh, part of the process. And so here, uh, you can see we run a schedule check um, and identified a couple of things, warnings, if you will. When I look at these warnings, and again, the mindset here is that we're looking for things that may potentially impact the schedule risk analysis. As we're doing a risk analysis, we want to make sure that the schedule is free-flowing, that as we model the effects of uncertainty and risk and the things that can happen to the project, that the, the schedule itself is able to, to update properly. If we have things like constraints or different types of lags that may be percentage-based, et cetera, then we have uh, we may not get the desired effects that we're looking for and may not model that realistic view of the project that we're looking to to get. So I can see here um, a couple of warnings, not a big deal, my start and my finish. I can accept those and just mark those off. And then um, as I look at my contract there, um, I see they have an activity here that has a must finish on constraint. I can quickly jump back into the uh, project schedule itself. And so you can see here, I'm already back in the project. I'm able to uh, review that activity. I see it's the agree contract activity. Now, this might represent a valid business constraint where we impose as part of the business to say, no, we have to have a contract in place as of that date. Uh, for the purposes of analysis, uh, I might have a risk, and I want to model that risk against the activity. If I have a constraint, 
it won't model that at that risk properly or that un, even that uncertainty. So for the purposes of the analysis, I'm going to go ahead and remove that constraint. Now, uh, as we do the analysis, the schedule will update properly, the activities will be modeled, uh, and I'll understand really the impact of those risk against those activities. I'll just jump back here, rerun my schedule check, nothing else that I haven't reviewed, and so um, I can continue on now with step three, which is model and analyze. As you may have noticed, we're beginning to work our way from left to right across the application. Uh, you can see here these next four tabs is uh, where we'll be spending some time doing the model, modeling and analysis, and then the, the rest of the tabs there give us a view into our results, and so we'll be touching on those there shortly. So model and analyze. As I bring up, I have my project risk uh, register here, if you will. Uh, Again, just like we saw with the global risk, kind of a common interface that we've seen in a lot of the, the tools that have been in the market, um, very easy to use, very easy to understand what's going on here. And so I'm able to understand that I've got a variety of risks that I've defined and a variety of capabilities, very powerful capabilities to model the different types of uh, risk and uncertainty that I want to. So a couple of things we'll want to note. One, um, kind of the, the standard approach, again, probability and impacts. I'm modeling both schedule and cost impacts. I have the ability to model both absolute and relative impacts. And so in this particular case, uh, what that represents is an absolute impact uh, defines a specific number of days or a specific cost range that I want to define uh, using the distributions, triangle, trigon, normal, et cetera. Uh, those common uh, distribution shapes are supported as well. When I see uh, a relative impact, what that means is I'm using a percentage basis to model that impact, so a percentage type overrun on cost or on schedule. So again, a lot of flexibility here already and able to uh, model both my schedule and cost and the different types of impacts. Now, I'm reviewing my risk register. Um, I see that I've got uh, a, a good number of risks here that I've brought in. I've also was able to define uh, some uncertainty, some risk factors around uncertainty. And uh, the way I did that was by saying that the probability was 100%, which means whatever activities I map them to, it'll always affect them. And I'm using that relative cost impact, the relative schedule impact here to model an uncertainty range. So what we'll see when I get into mapping here in a couple of minutes um, is that rather than having to necessarily go each activity individually, one by one, and, and handcraft the uncertainty estimate around each one, I can use these risk factors and much more easily apply them to my schedule to get a better sense of the overall uncertainty. Because they're part of my risk register here, that this list of risks that I'm working from, when I do my analysis later, when I get into my sensitivity analysis to try to understand um, what is driving my project schedule, I'll have some insight into that because they're actually part of my overall risk analysis. I recall that I had a global risk uh, list earlier. I want to kind of take a quick look through that list and see if there's anything I think that might uh, apply to this particular project. I do know that we've got some design risk going on. I'm going to go ahead and pull uh, that risk in as well. So you can see I pull it in. It pulls in that definition. If I want to change that definition and customize it here for my particular project, I can do that. Um, or I can leave it as is. I think the, the estimates here and kind of the overall definition is accurate, so I'm going to go ahead and continue forward. So that's our um, evaluating our risk and defining our risk. Um, very easy to add additional impacts, uh, you know, and update the risk register here, this quantitative risk register, as I see fit uh, to map it to my project. So the next part of modeling and analyzing is defining the relationships between these risks. So we do that under the correlations tab. So as I delve into that, and what I'm going to do is just to kind of uh, make it easier to see everything, I'm going to pull it back in to just the relationships that I already have defined. And so correlations have been kind of a tricky area uh, historically in risk analysis. Our approach in using risk factors uh, as part of the overall way we model risk helps take that into account. We're automatically correlating those risks across all the activities. Additionally, I want to make sure that as I uh, think about how these risks occur uh, and might impact my project, I want to think about how they might be related. For instance, high winds. I know that any time we have high winds as part of this project, it's going to uh, typically 
causes a testing overrun. So those two are related. High winds typically causes a testing overrun. I'm able to make sure that we take that into account as part of the model by correlating or relating those two risks to each other so that they happen simultaneously uh, when we run the analysis. And again, it's a way to just bring things in, make sure the model uh, accurately represents what we know about our project, the risk, and how things typically happen and unfold uh, when we do the analysis. So I've identified my risk uh, and quantified the impacts. I've established the relationships between those risks. And so now I'm going to get into risk mapping. And so you can see here, um, this is kind of rolled up to a summary view. Uh, if I want to flatten that out, again, one of the great things about this is that we are um, using Safran Project to uh, you know, run the schedule for us. And so um, if I had additional layouts here that I wanted to customize the layout, very common when I was doing risk workshops previously, uh, there'd be a series of layouts that the scheduler may have built, or the team may have built. When you bring things back and forth between different tools, sometimes it can be challenging to recreate those layouts. Because we're using Safran Project, I've got the ability to use those layouts. Um, even something as simple as just kind of flattening the view out or doing that, once I do that, I've got that same view here. And so now I'm just looking at the activities without the, the summary of the WBS. Now, um, what I want to make sure I show is also that even with the summaries, we have a great deal of flexibility with how we go about doing the mapping. So I'm going to break these out so we can see a little bit more detail. Now, as Jeff mentioned, um, there's been challenges in the past sometimes about how do I do a scheduled risk analysis and how does the risk analysis evolve over time through a project life cycle. So early on in a project life cycle, it's high-level summary activities, not a lot of detail. We can support that. Um, easy way to support that is to go in and as you do a mapping, um, potentially here, here's an example. If I just want to say this outsource, outsource the design to a third party, um, or this opportunity for outsourcing, um, it's easy to apply a risk at a summary level and we then cascade it down to all the activities. But maybe I think our specialty is in guidance and I don't want to outsource the guidance system. I can easily pull that opportunity off that activity uh, and now I've just mapped it to selected activities under that summary, but we still have visibility into what's going on. Uh, conversely, I have the ability just to map it to a couple of activities. I could do a bottoms up approach where I go in at a very detailed level uh, maybe later in my project life cycle, or maybe as I've defined, um, I kind of want to focus on certain areas of my project schedule. I can delve in at the detailed level and do a detailed mapping there. So a lot of flexibility in how we're able to map those risks uh, and what we're able to do uh, with that. Now, as I've mapped these risks, you come over here and you can see um, on the right-hand side, I can see for each one of those risks that I've mapped to an activity, at an activity level or summary level, I can see the risks that have been mapped against that. If I'm not quite sure exactly what the details are, uh, I can easily drill into that, see, understand uh, you know, the overall, um, how those risks have been mapped together um, and the details of those, and make sure that, again, I've got a, the appropriate level of risk applied to each activity and understand what I've, you know, what I've done to this point um, because these risk registers can get pretty large. Um, in this case, you know, we show them all here and you can easily go and see the mapping. Um, and again, a lot of flexibility, very easy to use. Um, the other consideration that I have too is the ability to model the risk in series or parallel. So uh, in series means that if these two risks impact the activity, they would be modeled one after the other and so their impact would be cumulative in nature. If I were to model them in parallel, um, if they happen to be simultaneously, effectively the largest schedule impact would be um, kind of measured against that activity. The cost would of course be included, um, but we would only maybe represent the actual total or the, the largest uh, schedule duration risk impact. So, um, so here we are, basically I've gone through and completed almost everything in uh, step three, which is to define my risk, define my relationships, do my risk mapping, and now I'm ready to do the analysis. Very easy, one click, we run the analysis, and now we're into step four, which is review the results. So here we are, um, the view that we've all kind of 
come to know and love, which is the histogram. I'm able to see um, exactly kind of my, my results here. Um, again, we're looking at both uh, the schedule as well as cost, right? Integrated cost and schedule. If you're uh, cost loading or resource loading your schedules, you can see that here. Um, able to easily um, see how my deterministic finish, that is my planned finish, compares to my, my reference here as a P80, pretty common in the industry. Uh, and so what we're doing here is we're comparing and um, deterministically, 25-26% uh, chance uh, given all these risks and I'm able to see, you know, kind of the delta between those around six weeks. Okay, so that's something if I can work with. This gives me a view into the what. What uh, is the impact of all of those risks against my project schedule and my cost? What I don't quite yet have insight into is what's driving my project schedule. And the way I would go about doing that is by looking at my drivers and sensitivity analysis, and that would give me insight into the why. So as I drive into my, delve into my drivers, I can see that the one we mentioned earlier, uh, a couple of things that we talked about earlier, the high winds and the outsourcing opportunity are shown here as being part of my risk uh, drivers. And so on the left-hand side, I have my risk drivers, and on the right-hand side, I've got my activity drivers. And again, that's important because I may think I know uh, what my key risks are, but it's not always apparent to me necessarily what activities uh, ultimately end up driving my project as well, too. And so I can see just by doing a quick scan that I have a lot of my testing activities and a lot of my fabrication activities are showing up um, as being some of my riskier activities. And so that kind of gives me some insight into where I need to either go focus my attention or revisit the schedule, review those risks, and begin to better understand you know, what's going on and, and what can I do to maybe uh, mitigate the impact of those. So um, what I want to do now, um, so I've delved in, I kind of understand, I've got high winds, I've got outsourcing, I have these activities. I can delve a little deeper and uh, do a further sensitivity analysis. And the way we go about doing the sensitivity analysis is by rerunning the risk analysis again this time removing the risk one by one to understand their individual impact against the project schedule. And so I'm going to go ahead and just sort this by impact on scheduled days. I'll focus on my days first. Um, and just to kind of walk through and give us a little bit more insight, I want to just look at high winds, which was my top risk from the previous uh, view, against uh, my baseline risk schedule. So the black line here on the right is the S-curve for my project finish with all the risk included. So I excluded none of my risks. That's why it says none. So here is my project finish with high winds, and here is my project finish if I remove it. And so by mitigating high winds, I can see the schedule savings that I would have at an 80% level of confidence. And I'm able to do that for every risk that I've defined. I can see here that the difference is 18 days, and it would save me $183,000 in this example. Okay, So that's the impact of mitigating uh, a risk entirely. If we're able to completely remove uh, that risk, that would be the benefit to the project. Conversely, if I want to take a look at opportunities, right? we talked about opportunities for outsourcing. Um, outsourcing, we can see, is to the right of that which means that if I don't outsource, right, and again, it's kind of a different way of thinking about it. If I don't outsource, I actually add eight days to my project schedule, right? So that's something important for me to remember and to think about, and actually kind of a great insight. We've been a lot of debate in my project here about whether or not we should outsource and is it worth the benefit of it. Um, and so while I do save money by not outsourcing, it does cost me eight days. And so I'm actually going to go grab this scenario now that I realize this is the scenario that I've got uh, with limited outsourcing. I'm going to go ahead and save this over to my comparison chart um, and then think about that and come back a little bit later and see if we might want to revisit that. So, um, and again, here's kind of my spread now of, you know, just seeing the impact of there's my risk schedule, there's my schedule without outsourcing, and there's my schedule if I'm able to uh, mitigate those high winds, which is my biggest impact, my biggest negative impact against my project. So this kind of insight's giving me some thoughts, and I want to go back and take a look at my risk mapping now. So again, as part of my reviewing results process, as part of step four, 
um, I have the ability to kind of iterate through, right? And so we did talk about a simple five-step process, but we do know it's an iterative process. And so you can see how easy it is to go back through and iterate through that process and take uh, and work through a couple different scenarios. And so uh, I do want to also capture my cost as well. So before I forget, let me just I'm gonna go ahead and save my cost off as well. And so again, I'm able to save um, and do comparisons around both my project finish and my project cost. So I'm going to go back to my risk mapping. And you know we've been debating whether or not we want to, if it's worth the cost of having to outsource the design. Um, we thought you know if we were able to do that, maybe we can save some more time on the schedule. Uh, there is some cost impact to that, and so we're just not sure if it's worth it. And so by going in now um, and remapping those activities to design activities, I'm going to go ahead and rerun my analysis. And so you can see now I have a different graph. My histogram has changed. I can see now that it, uh, you know, some things have shifted in my finish state. And so interesting to me to look at. I can walk back through again um, and review kind of, okay, what's driving my schedule now. Uh, I can see that outsource has now had a much stronger impact on my project. And so just by outsourcing those few additional activities, I can see now that, wow, that, that really does have, uh, it really is driving my project finish. And I can see now that um, fabrication and design are much more of a project driver. And I'm able to uh, recalculate some impacts here and do that deep dive analysis on my individual uh, risk and see how things might have shifted. So we still see high wind still has a significant impact, but outsourcing has a much greater impact now uh, individually. So as an opportunity, um, it now actually shifts the schedule by 18 days. Now, easy way to confirm that and to visually represent that, so I'm going to save off um, that graph and also save off my cost graph. And so now when I jump back into uh, my distribution comparison, what I'm able to see here, so scenario one was the first one with limited outsourcing, and I see where my project finish date is. Scenario two is my project finish with additional outsourcing. And I can see that already I was able to shift the schedule back and gain additional days. So even with the risk, doing nothing else other than just shifting more things to outsourcing, I've already proven that I could save schedule time. Typically, scheduling equates to money. You know, if I'm able to bring the schedule in, I can save money. However, I do know that I have additional cost burden with outsourcing. The question is, was that cost benefit analysis worth it? Did it actually uh, benefit? the overall project and so I can go back in and I can look at it and yes in this particular case even though we had to spend money to outsource the um, project to a third party to do the, the design and fabrication that, that was money well spent because overall I was still able to reduce my overall project cost um, through doing that so again now this, this is great information I want to be able to report out Right? And that brings us to step five. How do I go and get this information out of this application uh, back to my executives so they can see it, they can understand the scenarios and the analysis that I did? Well, each one of these uh, charts that we looked at are all easily exportable. Right? It's very easy to export. Uh, you can export them. Um, any one of these, uh, you know, again, finish costs, all of the driver graphs, uh, the sensitivity analysis, each one of these, as well as the distribution comparison, uh, can all be exported for use. Uh, we export them as images, so you've got this great visualization of that. Uh, you've got the visualization that's easy to put into a PowerPoint, able to put into a Word document, uh, Excel spreadsheet, whatever you need to uh, make that presentation out to the executives so that you can see, um, you know, again, the process you went through, the analysis you were done, and how you were able to, um, you know, better uh, control and report and understand your project risk and reduce your project risk through following those five simple steps. And so again, um, before I turn it back over to Jeff, we'll just do a quick recap of what we did uh, using Safran Risk today. So we got started, we came in and we saw that we had global risk, and then step one was schedule, right? We were able to um, bring in a schedule, or we brought in a schedule, whether or not we were using the integrated Safran scheduler, we have the schedule available to us. We validated and edit that schedule. Uh, we went through and made some changes, removed some constraints just to make sure we had a better quality risk analysis. Um, we then went through a series of uh, modeling and exercising activities where we 
define the project risk, we define the relationships between them, and then map those risks to the activities. After we ran the analysis, we then went through and looked at our results. Um, we saw our distribution graphs. We saw, you know, the what the uh, what was the impact of the project schedule, and then we took some time to understand why that was the impact to our project schedule and what we could do about that. Um, and in the end, we packaged it all together, put it in a report, sent it off to executives, uh, and had a better understanding of, um, you know, how we were able to understand the impact of risk and potentially also mitigate those risks against our project schedule. So with that, uh, Jeff, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay. So great overview, Wes. I really appreciate it. I hope everyone got a really good feel for, for SAFRA risk. And uh, so I mentioned earlier, we're, we're definitely not doing this all uh, internally. We're, we're putting the product out there for review by thought leaders. So here's some feedback we've received uh, already. So we're getting good feedback on the product, and, uh, and, and, and that's great. I'll leave this here, and when you watch it back in the recording, you can definitely read through this. But really, to recap, um, I think the, the, the best advantage Stafford Risk has is we've just assembled a low-class crew of people uh, in the risk space. We've got a lot of folks that have been developing risk tools for a long time for the market. We've pulled together and helped us structure, build, and deliver this tool. That's the best advantage. I hope, I hope we've communicated that. But specifically in the product, the built-in schedule engine, the big differentiator for our product, uh, the intuitive and process-led user interface. So it's important in these tools that they're easy to use, easy to pick up, and easy to communicate that what you're showing to, to your wider audience. And I think this tool really does an effective job of doing that. The full risk mapping that Wes walked through, the risk readiness schedule check, uh, the reporting, again, best-in-class reporting, we make it very easy for you to export images out in a variety of, uh, into a variety of tools for communicating your risk analysis and, and your risk plan. And then the comprehensive risk correlation. So this is a, an area that's been traditionally very difficult, and we've made it easy to use a, a matrix to help correlate your risks. And with that, um, I'll hand it back to Katie to uh, manage the Q&A section. So Katie, back to you. Thanks, Jeff. That was a great presentation. I've gotten some comments, actually, from the audience saying that it was uh, some very useful and informative information. So, uh, so I'm glad folks are enjoying it. Um, so we've had a number of questions come in. Um, one of them um, is related to the uh, constraint uh, question. Um, uh, did you want to answer that, Wes? Yeah, uh, that question comes up a lot, and I think I saw that uh, as we were going through. Um, again, it goes back to that schedule check where we were talking about uh, looking at the constraint and I having to remove a constraint from the analysis. Um, always kind of a, a hot topic, I guess, if you will, uh, when it comes to risk analysis. If you think about uh, how we design a, a schedule and the network, we really want it to be free-flowing so that as we update durations and we model the impact of durations, we see that impact cascade through the project. If we have a constraint, a hard constraint on an activity, we effectively stop that free-flowing movement of the schedule. Now. Uh, it doesn't, it just, it can impact the overall quality and understanding of how things might actually impact the schedule. And again, here was a case where we modeled the a business constraint of we have a hard stop, we want to have a contract in place by this date. Realistically, stuff happens in the business world and, con and contracts don't get done on time, they do get delayed. Well, what does that do? How does that affect the project after that point in time? The only way we know by modeling that risk is to make sure we remove that constraint if the schedule updates. So again, these are recommendations. They're not hard and fast rules. The application can do it. We can still model it. It just won't quite show you the results that you're anticipating because of, you know, particularly some of those schedule limitations or constraints you might have in place. So great question. Thank you. Thanks, Wes. So we have a couple of other questions. Um, and the same person that asked about the constraints also asked about um, importing schedules. So the question is, I know you can import your schedule from P6. Can you export it back in if you make changes to that schedule? Wes, you want to handle that one? You want me to? Uh, yeah, no. Yeah, Importing and exporting is supported. Uh, we have no, um, and again, it just kind of depends on the environment that you're working in. Um, we're able to, you know, not only support the import of project schedules, but also uh, exporting as well, too. Um, and again, you just don't have to manage those changes uh, once you get back into the other scheduling tool you might be using. Benefit of using uh, Safran Project and Safran Risk, they're all one uh, kind of tightly integrated solution. 
um, leveraging the same kind of enterprise scheduling engine and, and storage. So uh, in that case, if you made it and you were using Safran Project, no need to worry about it. Those changes are saved right back to the schedule. Great, thanks. Um, the next question is, what software platform is the product written in? Glenn, that might be a good one for you. I was uh, just about to jump in there. Uh, <laughs> hi, everyone. Glenn Jarrett, uh, the <laughs> chief architect on Safran Risk. Um, it's, it's developed in, uh, in dot, .NET, basically, using all, all the latest .NET technologies. So, um, and if you're familiar with it, sort of a, a WPS, Windows Presentation uh, Foundation. So that's the, uh, the, the architecture that it's uh, developed on. Thanks, Juan. Great, thank you. Um, one of the other questions is, is there a risk form that is initially used for defining the risks? There's, there's not a, a form as such, but uh, what, what we will be supporting is the ability to sort of take um, risks from, uh, from typically Excel, which I know is uh, an area a lot of people um, hold their, their uh, risks inside spreadsheets. So you'll be able to uh, just import the risks straight into uh, Safran Risk from, from Excel. So, but there's not a sort of a, the inbuilt form is basically what uh, Wes was showing you there. So, um, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, this question is about um, our licensing model. Um, so the person has asked if um, we have a named user or shared license model, and um, if it's um, um, an all-inclusive software cost or if there are maintenance costs and, and that kind of thing. Um, I know that we probably want to take some of those real specific questions offline, but we can probably give them an idea of our licensing model. Yeah, yeah. Sounds like that one belongs to me, Katie. Uh, yeah, so the software can be licensed both in a named user or in a concurrent model. Um, and um, maintenance is applied. There's an annual maintenance fee on top of, of your sales price. So, uh, yeah, I think that covers the questions. Now there's a question about the database. So the question is, what is the database used in the program? Sure. Um, I'll, I guess I'll probably jump into that one again. Um, the database um, we're using at the moment, database uh, technology at the moment, is, is Microsoft is SQL Server that we're using behind the scenes, but we'll also be supporting uh, Oracle um, very shortly as well. So uh, hopefully that answers that one. And here is a related question. Um, what other project control software can be integrated with Safran Project and Safran Risk? So that's kind of a big question. They just said project control software as opposed to just scheduling software. So I'll, I'll let you figure out how to rattle off an answer. <laughs> <laughs> or who <laughs> to answer. <laughs> Um, I think that was, uh, well, first of all, integrate versus um, uh, uh, import. Uh, so Wes ran through the schedules that can be imported into RISC, um, and I'm not quite sure which side of this we're falling on. So we covered P3, P6, SureTrap, Microsoft Project. Uh, Wes, did I miss any? Uh, I think you got them all. Okay. From an integration standpoint, yeah, that's definitely a deeper question, but project, Safran project uh, has an API layer for integration. So if you have, uh, say, a time and attendance tool or some other kind of um, application you're asking about around project controls um, um, or an EVM tool or something like that, um, you would you would leverage the API, API layer to integrate. Um, so, yeah, we have an open API for integration. Hopefully that answered the question. Great. Thank you. Um, if it didn't, they can send in another uh, question. We're going to give you um, contact yeah, yeah. information. We're going to give Absolutely. everyone contact information. Um, I received another question, which was, can we look at and understand better the correlation of risk impacts to activities? Um, and you might want to take that offline, but maybe you can, um, as far as demonstrating, but maybe you, one of you can cover that. Yeah, I think some of that, uh, so there's two parts of that. One is us kind of in, uh, imposing correlation on the schedule itself or those, those risk and activities. We do that, um, so there's a relationship between the actual risk itself and the activity that's done through the mapping. The relationship of risk to each other is done through the correlations. And then understanding the, um, how those risk impact or what those risk drivers are is done in that sensitivity analysis where we had the risk drivers. That's really showing us which of those risks most often 
were happening that caused a delay in the project. Uh, in a similar fashion, the sensitivity analysis of the project activities is showing us which activities were most often um, delaying the project. And so that's how we get insight into the correlation between risk and activities and the overall project finished or cost in that regard. Thank you. Um, so here's a, another very specific um, question, um, but, but really rev relevant and a differentiator for us. Um, the question is, can you please throw some light on qualitative and quantitative risk, model, risk modeling? Yeah, absolutely. I think this is a kind of an interesting point, right? And so uh, the, the field and kind of the overall industry has definitely matured a lot, um, I guess, in the last few years or so regarding um, it's um, very important, of course, to have a qualitative risk register where you're able to communicate uh, at, a, at, a, at a high level what those risks are and kind of a qualitative assessment. Um, what we've often found, though, is that when those qualitative assessments were mapped in a quantitative fashion that is actually applying um, some discrete percentages and discrete impacts against the project schedule, uh, the results were often quite enlightening. Sometimes things that look to be um, major risk um, because they actually didn't impact critical path activities, for instance, didn't end up having that much of a significant impact to the overall project schedule, whereas relatively minor risk um, because of where they, the key activities they impacted did have a significant impact. Um, you know, and previously I've worked with customers that had, um, you know, had to model certain delivery dates or they had to pay damages and et cetera and sorts of things. And so relatively minor impact, relatively small risk qualitatively um, because of where they fit in the project schedule really had, um, doing this quantitative risk analysis really enlightened the overall project team and the executives into the importance of those risks. And so you didn't have both, um, but I think really modeling the, qual the quantitative and seeing the overall impact and then rolling that back up to the organization uh, to show the impact of those risks across multiple parts at an enterprise level is really kind of a key value that Safran Risk brings to the table. Um, how do you calculate risk probability um, in parent? I'm sorry, in parens it's a, it's a, it says percentage. So how do you calculate the risk probability percentage? Is there a function to help you do that? Um, not natively in the application right now. Um, what we're, I think what you're kind of getting at is how do you really know? And so again, where that information can come from is a couple different sources. Um, if you have a quanti uh, qualitative risk register, Many times there's an implied percentage range or thresholds that are set as part of that qualitative risk register. And so you can use that as a starting point. Um, and again, what we're doing in this particular case is um, trying to apply our best judgment as to how, you know, what we think the likelihood of something occurring is and using that percentage. Um, I've also seen um, some relatively mature organizations that did have good, you know, strong project controls and did have great historical data and lessons learned. Um, actually pull some information out, and that's kind of the inspiration, I think, around our global risk register here, or the global risk list, is that um, pulling out information from the organization to help guide and understand how likely risks are to occur. Um, at a global level or a regional level, you can get insight from looking at kind of past performance and past history to understand um, how, likely, how likely a risk is to occur, and then just translate that into a percentage basis. Um, so, um, a variety of techniques that can be used to kind of help model that. And again, that's the value of a quantitative risk analysis is you can, you can apply that, you can run that and say, well, we think it's not very likely. Uh, it may only be a 10 or 15% chance. Conversely, maybe part of the team is split and says, no, 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 we think it's much more likely. Here I have the ability to do a comparison of, well, if it's a 10% likelihood, the schedule looks like this. If it's a 50% likelihood, the schedule looks like this. And so you actually have um, a means to quantify the delta between those estimates and look at them and have a much more thorough discussion within the controlled environment and your project controls and as well as within the organization overall. So, great question. I uh, just wanted to uh, let everybody know that, of course, you can get in touch with us. You've had some, some um, very specific questions. You saw a lot of um, a lot of information in a very short amount of time, and um, there's much more <laughs> to see. So we really want you to um, to get in touch with us. 
with us if you have any questions. We're happy to show you whatever you'd like to look at and answer any questions. Um, the best way to do that is to just send an email to sales at saffron.com or visit our website um, and uh, watch for upcoming events, more information um, on our products. And there's always always something new on, on the homepage of our website. So, um, so please uh, get in touch with us. Um, someone's asking if we will be given access to the if you'll be given access to the PowerPoint. Um, we are going to send a recording of the, of the webinar, but I'm not. Sh I don't see why we wouldn't um, make the uh, PowerPoint available. Um, so uh, we weren't planning on that, but um, we will at the very least make the recording available in the next couple of days. Oh, I've been given the go-ahead. Yes, you can definitely have the slides. <laughs> Uh, again, please get in touch with us if there's anything that we can do to answer questions or um, or help you. All right. Thank you very much for joining us today, everyone, and uh, almost everybody stayed throughout the whole presentation. So we really appreciate your time today, and uh, have a wonderful weekend. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, presenters. Yeah.